Mildred. Mildred. A name gasped in the night. The one last word of a dying man. But one word that tells a thousand stories of a woman who left her mark on every man she met. Mildred had more to offer a man in a glance than most women give in a lifetime. Mildred knew what she wanted. It wasn't too particular how she got it. Mildred? Loving her was like shaking hands with a devil. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. podcast devoted to honoring the world of classic cinema. As always, I'm Kristen Lopez. And I'm Samantha Ellis. And we are joined by a very special guest this episode talking about Joan Crawford and the 1945 feature Mildred Pierce. It's William Shoel. William, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? Oh, we are doing great. We are so excited to have you on. You are one of the co-authors of Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography. The question to kick things off with is, what sparked your interest in Joan? I know that the introduction lays out some things, but for people who haven't read the book yet, what sparked your interest in Joan and how did that translate into wanting to tell her story in this book? I got involved in working on this book because I always felt that it was extremely unfair that Crawford had become a national joke because of her daughter's book. Even if you felt the allegations were true, I thought she deserved respect for her hard work, staying on top on Hollywood, reinventing herself over and over again, and having a career in an extremely tough business. And I didn't feel that her daughter's book was honest. I felt it was sort of revenge well, being cut out of the will, and I found a lot of it suspect. And her other children said that nothing ever went on in the house, and they were there. So I thought it was time to write a book that might even the score. She wasn't a perfect human being by any means, but I felt she deserved to be looked at, at her career, at her accomplishments, not just the negative publicity. When I know you co-wrote this with Lawrence Quirk, who's done a fair amount of biographies, what was the process of writing this with him at the time? Well, he originally contracted to write the book with the University Press of Kentucky. And then when he started work on it, he had already done a book called The Films of Joan Crawford. And he said to me, why don't you write the passages, younger generation looking at her films? through fresh eyes, because he'd seen the movies. I'd seen them too, but he'd seen them a hundred times. He said, why don't you write the passages on her films, which is what I did. So that's how we divided up the work. I also did some work on the personal life, but primarily I was looking at her films, her career. Was there anything about her that you learned in the process of working on this that was a wow moment or something that you didn't know or something that you had to reevaluate, something that stands out to you? I realized that she had been unfairly devalued as an actress, even though she'd won an Oscar for Mildred Pierce. People just seemed to think of her as playing the Joan Crawford role. She was always the same in every movie. That wasn't quite true. When you look at her silent period and her early period before she really made it big, she really was a very gifted and expressive actress. She really learned everything she knew about acting. She was in the business an awfully long time. So I had a lot of admiration for her. As she kept going year after year, even when she was called box office poison, even when she thought she was washed up, she always came back. I admired her strength, a very strong person. I want to get Samantha's viewpoint in here, too. I don't want to leave her out. Samantha, do you remember the first Joan Crawford movie you saw? Oh, gosh, that's a good question because she made so many. It's hard to pick the first. I honestly don't know if I can tell you, really. What's, What's the first one that stands out to you? I would say probably Mildred Pierce or maybe the women. But again, like, it seems like I discovered both of those so recently that, no, you know what? Now I remember the very first Joan Crawford film I saw was The Bride Wore Red. That is what put, I don't want to say totally put me off of Joan Crawford because I obviously ended up having an appreciation for her. I first saw that film without seeing any of her other work. They sort of 
the costume and the hair that they give her in that film, it's obvious that they just wanted Greta Garbo and just settled for Joan Crawford. <laughs> seeing that, seeing her basically play or at least appear like a pseudo Garbo really put me off. I was like, oh, if that's Joan Crawford, I don't really want to watch any of her other movies. But that is the exception <laughs> rather than it's the rule. It's interesting because she does not not give a particularly good or memorable performance in that. And that may be for the reasons you've just outlined. Right. Yeah. She really isn't herself in that one. Again, the hair and the costume is what I think of particularly. She's beautiful in it. Don't get me wrong. It's just not Joan whatsoever. It's funny. I would say my discovery of Joan and looking at her films and her as an actress Really, other than, of course, the book about her, I would say the other really negative press that she gets is the Betty versus Joan feud. Of course, the last couple of years, that's been highlighted specifically. Anybody who, who listens to this podcast knows I absolutely detest Betty Davis. She's my <laughs> least favorite old Hollywood actress. So when I was first getting into old Hollywood and I knew that I didn't like Betty Davis, I was like, okay, I'm Team Joan, even though I really hadn't discovered her work. I was more Team Joan by default. My sister really has gotten more into her the last few years. She is a much bigger Joan fan than even me. She's shown me a lot of her best work and a lot of the reason for dedication, her perseverance in Hollywood. And that's really made me gain a lot of respect for her. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that you don't care for Betty Davis because Betty Davis always felt she was the great artist and Joan Crawford was just the trooper and not on her level of artistry. And I think Crawford always resented that. And I think that very much led into their feud, which has been highly exaggerated, although it made a great miniseries, very entertaining. But Crawford resented that. She thought that she was just as gifted as Davis I'd love to know what you think of Davis in her later period when she started developing those mannerisms and splitting all her sentences into three parts and that arch brittle way of acting. Crawford never did that. She always gave a good performance no matter what she was in. I think it's really funny looking at Joan's career specifically. Everyone believes or has the negative opinion that she overstayed her welcome in Hollywood. But I think it's so fascinating that her career basically lasted as long as Hollywood's golden age did. She left Hollywood right when she should have with Trog. Yeah, that was it. That's a good time to say goodbye, I think. But really everything before that was still solid. Street Jacket is, of course, somewhat considered a big Enter horror movie, but... Entertaining, and she's, Entertaining. she gives a good performance, yeah. She plays and, with our customary and authority. Looking at Betty Davis, she acted well into the 1980s. I'm not exactly sure when she passed, but pretty much right up until she passed. Talk about overstaying your welcome in Hollywood. I just like Betty for more personal reasons in addition to her <laughs> work. I, I know we shouldn't get into Betty too much. We're talking about Joan, but Joan... I don't understand really all the flack. It's great that we're having this conversation and that there are books like your book talking about her career, her accomplishments, and her dedication to her craft that make her such an icon still. And unfortunately, she's been criticized for that because she was professional. She always wanted to represent Hollywood, no matter what she did, no matter where she went. Some could say that's ridiculous. She was always on although that wasn't quite the case. But I think that she should be admired for being professional at all times. Even Betty Davis, who couldn't stand her, said that she was a professional, which she was. Now it's looked as something to be ashamed of. I don't know why. It's funny because to go off of what Samantha was saying about her background with Joan, I come at it from a very weird roundabout way because the first thing that I had ever seen about Joan Crawford was the movie, the dreaded adaptation of Mommy Dearest, which that's a regular thing in my house. We quote it, we watch it, we love it in its own campy, weird way. What I got out of Mommy Dearest when I saw it as a child was not the camp and the 
overacting and all of the things that now it's lovingly revered for, but the tenacity of Joan Crawford as exhibited by Faye Dunaway. For all that movie's flaws, and there Mm. are many of them, Faye Dunaway does try to emphasize that Joan Crawford was a woman that was holding her own in a man's world. Exactly. 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 It did not give any Fs about what they wanted. And I was really attracted to that. And so I saw the movie and I was like, I want to know more about this person and this woman. And it was then that I went back into watching stuff like The Women, which is a movie that I don't particularly care for because to throw out things about celebrities we don't like, I don't like Norma Shearer. Samantha knows this. <laughs> That's the feud of chicken business, is the love or dislike of Norma, Norma Shearer. Shearer. But when I saw Mildred Pierce for the first time, I was like, that, that is what Faye Dunaway, I think, only scratched at a little bit in Mommy Dearest, is showing the acting power of Joan in Mildred Pierce. In a weird way, the movie that often is maligns her and and a lot of people know as being really this horrific portrayal of her in many ways inspired me to want to know more about her and and made me into a Joan fan so it's a really weird connection with that film I was actually just watching a Joan movie the other day I saw Forsaking All Others for the first time which it's not a great movie (laughs) (laughs) it's not the best Gable Crawford pairing but Bill, you're totally onto something that even when the movie's not good, and you mentioned this in the book, she did do her fair share of studio required pictures that were not great. But even when the movie's not good, she still gives 110% and she never looks down at the material and she never gives a wink and a nod to the audience. It's always done with the utmost respect and reverence, even when the work doesn't really require that. Yeah, I think you've just summed it up very nicely. Yes, even in something like Tron, she gives a (laughs) performance. She felt that she was going to do her job no matter what crap she was in. And she hated those movies. She really didn't like them. But she needed the money and she wanted to stay in the public eye. She was once a star, always a star. That was not going to change. So she did those pictures, Berserk, Straight Jacket, but she was generally good. Not always perfect, but she was good in most of those movies, and I thought she was great in Baby Jane. I know that in the book, in If Memory Serves, you did meet her, correct? Yes. Had lunch with her once many years ago. I was in my 20s. I was thrilled to meet the star of Baby Jane and Straight Jacket. I only had a vague awareness of her entire career before that. It was after meeting her that I became interested in finding out, seeing this incredible woman who had such a glamorous career and such a long one and really gave so many good performances and an Oscar winner. And I thought, wow, I wish I had done a little more homework and asked her some more questions. I asked her about the horror films and she didn't care for that. But she did answer. I mean, always the professional, right? Absolutely. Yes. (laughs) Well, I want to start talking about Mildred Pierce specifically, which is directed by Michael Curtiz, written by Renald McDougall, based off of James M. Cain's novel. Joan plays the eponymous Mildred Pierce, who is a hardworking mother who wants to have the best for her two daughters, specifically her eldest daughter, Vita, played by Samantha's favorite person on Earth, Anne Blythe. Good actress. Good actress. <laughs> but Vita wants more and more and more and nothing is ever good enough. And so in Mildred's grand quest to please Vita, she becomes a successful entrepreneur, but has a lot of other issues with her personal life that eventually devolves into murder and film noir admiration. I've seen this numerous times. It is out on HBO Max in case you have that and you want to see it again. You can also see it alongside the Todd Haynes, Kate Winslet remake, which is also on there, which is a very interesting and wholly different look at this movie. I love this movie. That everything about it is pure old Hollywood. Not even film noir, I think, is its own separate thing. But I think in terms of encapsulating 
the things we love about old Hollywood. I know Casablanca tends to be the de facto example, but I always cite Mildred Pierce for the glamorous clothes, the firecracker script, the amazing side characters that are all stars in their own right. Jack Carson and Eve Arden and Blythe yes. and Zachary Scott. So for me, this is the ultimate old Hollywood film. Bill, what are your past memories and connection to this movie? What do you think about it? It's a terrific picture. It's a classic and it deserves to be. Beautifully directed, beautifully acted, great score. As you say, every supporting part in that film is beautifully cast and well acted. So it's really a great picture. She felt she was washed up when she came to Warner Brothers. The first thing they offered her was Ice Follies. And it was a really terrible picture with Jimmy Stewart. It was just terrible. And she thought, wait a minute, she fought hard to get Mildred Pierce. And her friend Barbara Stanwyck wanted that role. Luckily, they chose Joan because Barbara Stanwyck would not have been bad in the role. But I think Crawford, it really revived her career. It made her a star once again, a, a player in Hollywood that lasted for quite a few years. Although not that many pictures were up to that level, unfortunately. You can't have everything. It's funny that you mentioned Barbara Stanwyck being up for this part too and comparing what she would have been like in this because... I would never use the word gentle to describe Joan Crawford, mm -hmm. but that's what she brings to this part as opposed to Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck would have been slightly too hard. Really, the only thing I would have to compare to imagine what she would be like in this would be Stella Dallas. Crawford has that complexity and fragility that she adds to the role. Like being a mom is just as important as running the restaurant and I agree with both of you. You both summed up my feelings about this movie. Just beautifully directed, perfectly cast. It really does deserve its ranks among the best Warner Brothers films of all time. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think you summed up what Crawford's performance, why she won her Oscar, why she deserved her Oscar, for the very reasons you mentioned. She shows vulnerability. And you don't normally think of Joan Crawford as being vulnerable at all. And boy, you're right, Barbara Stanwyck neither. Crawford did show that side and it worked for her. Yeah, Stanwyck is an interesting one. I love that Samantha brought up Stella Dallas because I feel like if she had starred in this, a lot of comparisons would have been, oh, this is just another Stella Dallas. And Stella Dallas is a movie that I don't really care for. Okay, we're going to get Kristen's soapbox about modern sensibilities and classic Hollywood. So I tend to have an issue with movies about mother love because they tend to be all or nothing. Stella Dallas is a prime example of that in the sense that Barbara Stanwyck's character goes through hell for her daughter and wants to give her everything, but she can never get rid of the taint, right, of being white trash. At the end of the movie, spoiler alert if you haven't seen Stella Dallas, but she ends up giving her daughter away and, and giving her to a nice life with her ex-husband, willingly walking away and only seeing her daughter's marriage from behind this fence. Ridiculous. <laughs> yes, it's a very specific kind of you have to be a beggar in the street for your children type of thing. And it's very hard for a lot of modern audiences, modern women to really engage with the movie in the way that it was meant to be in 1937, just because more ways about being a woman have changed. Not saying good or bad. I'm just saying that as the times change, we interact with movies differently. So watching Mildred Pierce is a really great experiment in that trope because Mildred is a successful woman. Her husband does leave, although in the movie we make, I noticed we made a really intentional, Mrs. Biederhoff isn't who her husband's dating, although in the book and in the remake, they are having this affair and eventually her husband does leave her and ends up hooking up with Mrs. Biederhoff. But in this, she's just the nice woman who helps out when Kay gets sick. Mildred does go through a lot of things and she has to sacrifice. She loses a child, but at the same time, that doesn't diminish her business acumen and her business accomplishments. She doesn't have good luck with dudes, but all of that is Vida as a character. This movie, you could really misinterpret it as the story of how women don't give your kids too much because if you do, they're gonna 
run roughshod over you and you're going to have to give up everything. That's not what this movie does. This movie is very intentional about the relationship between Vita and Mildred in the sense that Vita is that woman that believes that she deserves better for reasons that don't make any sense. She believes that she's special. What the husband says, Kay is twice the girl that Vita is because Kay doesn't put on airs. She's only 11, so that would make sense. I like that the movie doesn't go for that concept of women. It has to be all or nothing. You can still have these issues with your personal life, but the failure isn't on Mildred as a woman or as a mother. It's on Vita for being a leech and a horrible human being. (laughs) Absolutely, yes. And I love how they don't tell you specifically outright that Vita's horrible. They show you. You do have some dialogue from Eve Arden's character. Now I know why alligators eat their young. I love that line. They show you why Vita is the way she is. They also, just like you're saying, show that it's not Mildred's fault and that Mildred's doing everything she can, but there maybe should be a line in the sand somewhere. Absolutely. And Anne Blythe gives a terrific performance in that. She really does probably the best thing she's ever done, although she's done some other good things afterward. And I always admired her whenever people would try to get her to say something nasty about Crawford, she'd never give into it. She just never would do it. I think she got along well with Crawford. I think Crawford helped her in her performance and she just wasn't going to get pulled into that where after that, that book came out, everybody was digging up anything nasty they could say about Crawford, anything, and misinterpreting this, twisting that, anything bad that they could say. She never fell into that trap, and I thought that was good of her. Just as Krista was saying, I'm probably one of the biggest Anne Blythe fans on the planet. She had a ton of amazing roles. I mean, this, I think, is probably her most complex. Put it in on my list of Oscar snubs and our Oscar snubs episode. And I really genuinely think Anne Blythe should have won Best Supporting Actress for this. The only reason why she didn't is because she was up against Eve Arden for the same film. When you have yes. two actresses up for the same Oscar and the same movie, they never give it to either one of them. <laughs> That's true. That's uh, but, but an I think Oscar Anne curse. Blythe, Anne Blythe genuinely deserved it. And she did, just like you said, she made so many other incredible films, but she was just so perfectly cast in this. I mean, you really believe that she could be Joan's daughter. Even at, she was, what, 16 when she made this? You believe that she genuinely feels every single emotion that she feels and that she is that person. She truly embodied that character. In James and Kane's novel, they had something I'm very glad they cut out from the movie where Vita is walking across a, a courtyard and starts singing, and somebody hears her singing and says, that voice, I must make you an opera star or something. It's just ridiculous. And she does become a singer. That I thought, how could Kane? And it's a good book. It's a very good book. But I just thought that was, so they decided when they did the film to cut out that business with her suddenly, someone overhearing her and saying, what a great voice. I want to say that's kept in the Haynes remake. They emphasize it as just Vita is fickle and doesn't really know what she wants to do. So she tries everything. I always find that, especially the Kane novel, it's just so silly because what is it? She starts out playing piano and she's not good at the piano. And then the Kane book as you detail in in your book, somebody's like, oh, you're not good at piano, but you can sing. So I guess it's the same transition. It's just, you're like, wow, that's the decision that was made in that book. I don't don't know what he was thinking in that passage. No, (laughs) I don't know. They really could have included it. They were trying to spotlight Anne Blythe more because she had an absolutely incredible voice. It could have been used even more. I mean, she starred in quite a few musicals in the mid fifties, especially like The Student Prince, The Great Caruso, all of those. But yeah, it's really Joan's movie. I don't think that they were going to do that quite yet. I do want to throw out though, to Samantha's point about the Oscar. And I was looking at who won that year and it's just bananas. What 1945, the 1946 Oscars were because Anne Blythe was up against Eve Arden, obviously Joan Loring for the corn is green, Angela Lansbury for the picture of Dorian Gray. And the winner 
Does anybody know the winner? I, I'm, I'm taking guesses. Okay. I don't remember. No. I want to say Anne. No, well, I'm thinking Anne Revere for National Velvet, but that's 44. Was yep. it? Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's not even the best Anne Revere film. I mean, I don't think that's the best performance she gives. You know, my I would say uh, uh, Song of Bernadette. I would have would been be less upset about Angela Lansbury. <laughs> right? Like, if Angela Lansbury had won, I would have understood that. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand it at all. I, I would have given it to, like, anybody else. <laughs> but especially <laughs> Anne Blythe. But, like, please, Anne Blythe needed that Oscar. It would have done so much for her career, I think. It's, like, such a shame to me. I'm extremely biased. But I think Anne Blythe should have been a much bigger star. And even though she was, I think she should have been a much bigger star. But a, an Oscar would have done wonders for her. Did you see her in the picture where Claudette Colbert played a nun of yes, all things? Thunder on she the Hill. Played... I absolutely adore that one. Yes, she was quite good in that one too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's yeah, really her was... other wicked part. But I think it's a little less convincing because she's supposed to be like a murderer. <laughs> right. It doesn't make quite as much sense as just being like a spoiled brat like Vita is. <laughs> but, but yeah, she, she had a, an incredible career. What I think that this movie... Samantha, you said that this is Joan's film, but I do think it's both of them in unison because you can't have one without the other. It's like all about Eve. You know, you can't have Margot Channing without without Eve. That's just how it goes. And I think that the codependency of their relationship is showed in such a a complex way for 1945. Keep in mind, this is the year slowly we were starting to get into like psychology and I bring up my hatred of Spellbound as a great example of having to get the psychology in there. But I think that the script does a really amazing job of showing Mildred's growing dependency on Vita, especially as she starts to date Monty Baragon, the Zachary Scott character, and she knows that Vita wants a big house and she wants to, to live this high lifestyle. And when Vita comes back, when, when the dad brings her back after her marriage, just the look on her face of happiness that her daughter is back, you understand that this is the ultimate toxic relationship where they need, Vita needs her because she's an opportunist and a leech, but Mildred needs her because she really does tie everything into being a mother when she doesn't need to. And I think that, again, that's what's so smart about this movie and how it, I think, really subverts the expectations of, of womanhood in 1945 is that it's Mildred who makes her, her accomplishments and her motherhood, the, the success or failure of that, dependent on Vita. It doesn't have to be. Everybody else is like, no, you don't have to do this. But it is Mildred who is so dependent on Vita's approval. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, the codependency thing is really glaring. I think with each additional watch, every time I watch it, you can see earlier and earlier how dependent Mildred is on Vita specifically. Um, and really the, the moment for me is... Basic, it's sort of the same part that you're talking about, but for me, it's the fact that Mildred, essentially without Vita, gets her life together. You know, she seems like a nice, stable woman, and it's still that little thing in the back of her mind, like, I still have to have Vita in my life to mess it up again. <laughs> my life isn't right without Vita messing up my life. And I do think if you're talking about psychology, you could easily make an argument that another reason why she is so insistent on Vita being in her life and Mildred turning her into a decent human is because of Kay. The right. fact that you know yeah. she feels that guilt from Kay's passing that she couldn't do anything for her younger daughter. So she has to make sure her older daughter turns out well. Absolutely, yes. The, uh, the other girl's death is uh, has a great effect on Mildred, and I think that is why she puts up with so much with Vita for that reason. Yeah, well, she think... essentially feels like it's all sh she's all she has. Yes, all right. Right, and and I think Kay is such an underrated performance too. Uh, Joanne Marlowe played played Kay, and she's she's so peppy and 
you can understand where her death is really this withering on the vine, this death of potential because she's so sprightly. And it's ironic that Joanne Marlowe ended up dying relatively young herself. So it's just, it's amazing to kind of see that performance and how effective it is with such a small role, um, which could easily just be overshadowed as like the, the cute little kid with the cherubic cheeks who dies, uh, but she gives it a bit more life than that. And we can't discuss Mildred Pierce without bringing up Butterfly McQueen. Yes. She has a small role, but she, I love the way she goes to that movie and she's always going, beg pardon? Beg pardon? <laughs> you, you just sense there's something more to her story and I wish her character had been developed more. Of course, she wasn't a major character, but it's, it's interesting. She, it's an interesting performance as always with her. Well, and, and that performance and that character, I think, also says a lot about the other characters because, and we just talked about this, we did our Lana Turner tribute, and we were talking about the interaction between women and white women and their maids in movies. And I think what I really noticed this time around watching it is that Butterfly McQueen's character and Joan are, again, in that partnership of she's helping out with the business and making the pies and doing all this stuff. It is Vita that makes her put on the maid uniform and act like the maid. And right. I thought that said so much without doing, it's a throwaway line and it's it's Mildred who gets mad at Vita for putting her in the maid uniform because that's not her job, which I thought was just a very small moment, but it had so much impact into everything you need to know about these two characters. Like, oh, okay, so that's the type of woman that Vita is. <laughs> Very good point. That's true. Yes, Vita was not, well, let's face it, she wasn't a nice person on any level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One, I, you know, we, we're talking about, I think, the, the characters that are going around Mildred and, and Joan's performance. All of them are, are great. Uh, I think that Zachary Scott does does some really good work in here, too. He was never a big name i think he often played i think you you mentioned in the book bill that he often played a lot of cads in in his his work but he doesn't yeah he does a really good job here in terms of playing kind of this weakling this spineless type of guy who is wants to live this playboy lifestyle but is like a big kid and doesn't know how to budget or properly live his life and i think what I was really struck by watching it this time around and maybe I had confused the Haynes version as in my head is that when the relationship between Vita and Monty is discovered, which in the, the Haynes version, it's emphasized that Monty knew Vita as a child. So you have that whole like kind of like gross type of like interaction, but because it's Aunt Blythe, you have that deniability of like, oh, okay, age is not a question here. But I love in this go round that when that relationship is discovered and Vita says that they're gonna get married, he's like, wait a minute, hold on there. Who said that? I, I think he says, I must have been drinking. And I think I love that line delivery because <laughs> it's just, so relatable of like, I didn't say any of that. And he's the guy that knows where his bread is buttered. And it's all about Mildred. And he's not going to screw that gravy train up. Definite sleazeball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he obviously does screw up the gravy train. <laughs> but he's just not very smart about it. I don't remember if they included the murder in the remake. It's, it's not yeah. in the book. Did they put um, the murder in the remake. You know what, now that you mention it, I don't know. I know they keep the original ending in the remake. Mm -hmm. Which we can talk about in a second, but I know that that's in there. So it wouldn't surprise me if they took out the murder because I think the remake wants to be more of an adaptation of the right. book than an adaptation of the, the movie. So just means I'm going to have to rewatch it again. I don't know. But um, we have to talk Eve Arden briefly as we're talking about, about characters because... Eve Arden is just great. This was this was the first of two movies they did together, right, yes. Bill? Yes. Her and Joan? Uh, the other one. This, yeah. The this, other one was uh, Goodbye My Fancy, I believe. Which Goodbye yeah. My Fancy is um, it's a weird one. <laughs> yes. Not that memorable, uh, unfortunately. 
it's it's really not. Uh, I think I think you mentioned that there there was I or I read somewhere that there was a lot of scripting changes and and things that they adapted to kind of make it pretty toothless from what the original plot was. Um, but Evard's really good here. I think for someone like Joan, who is so proper and can often feel very hard and toughened, you need somebody that makes that toughness relatable. And I think that's what Eve Arden does um, as, as Ida is that she says like, no, you have every right to be this way because you're surrounded by a bunch of people that are treating you bad and Vita's horrible. So I, I love their interactions. I wish there were more of them. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, well, Eve Arden is one of those actresses who always classes up a picture. She graces a great movie and she lifts up a poor one, you know, one of those, uh, you know, Hollywood had a few of them and they were always welcome in whatever production they were in, particularly Eve Arden. The thing about Eve Arden to me, and I don't want this to be construed in any kind of negative way, but she really does play the exact same character in all yeah. of her movies. <laughs> yes. And, and I think another reason why I'm a little bit annoyed that she got the nomination, and I, I hate to say I still do blame her for Anne Blythe not getting the win. <laughs> it's just so frustrating to me. I think this is some of Eve, Eve Arden's best dialogue, which is saying a lot because she has amazing dialogue in all of her films. But it is that same kind of character. It's a very welcome character, as you're saying. Like, I love seeing her in everything. As one of my favorites of hers is actually Cover Girl. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, she's, it's the same. More of the was, same. More she of was the, typecast. They never yes. gave her a chance to do anything else. That's because she true. did that so well. It's and more that, of the amazing, genius, wit, same, but the same. <laughs> She was as typecast as uh, Cuddles Zakel or Zakol. Yeah. Cuddles Essie. <laughs> it's funny. I always play the same. Those Doris Day movies last night, and they had both Eve Arden and Cuddles <laughs> playing <laughs> the exact same character in like three different movies back to back to back. Yeah. They, well, Hollywood figure they do a good job in what they're doing. So we're just going to cast them again and again and again. And it must have been frustrating if they were dying to do something different. Or well, they may have felt, I'm employed. So, you know, <laughs> as long as they kept getting scripts, maybe they didn't care. I don't know. Jack Carson, too. I mean, he was right in the thick of it. But the thing, it, the thing with Jack Carson is, it, it's funny, he was actually, in my opinion, somewhat typecast. He was sort of like a poor man's Bob Hope, I guess you could say, for Warner Brothers, all those movies that he did with Dennis Morgan. But... In this, in Mildred Pierce, he's very refreshingly bad. Yeah, it's his I best performance. It. Yes, it's it's something that really, uh, you know, normally you think of Jack Carson, you think, okay, you know, he's all right. But in this, he really scored. He really uh, made quite an impact. He was very effective. I adored Jack Carson. I think he's, I, I personally love his musicals. I, I love the ones he did with Dennis Morgan. I love his comedy. But the fact that they were willing to cast him so against type for this is so fascinating. And it's a really welcome change. So I, I know we couldn't like go without mentioning Jack Carson because I, I do love him in this. Yeah, it's his, probably his best performance. I don't think I've ever seen him better in any, any other movie. And he's made quite a few. He's, always, he's good, but this was really uh, his best work, I think. And Bill, I don't know if you mentioned it in the book, but I know we've talked on the show regularly, Michael Curtiz as a director, and, uh, you know, there's been much written about him as being a very difficult director to work with, who had his favorites and people who refused to work with him. Do you know offhand how him and Joan got on on this film? I think they got along well. I think he, they both respected each other as professionals. So that was, you know, if someone, she was, like I say, she was a real professional. She wasn't going to give, she knew how important this picture was for her career, her life. Her career was her life. So she wasn't going to be difficult on that movie. And I think she knew that uh, Curtis was a respected, gifted director, experienced. So I think they got along fine. There may have been a few little disagreements, but nothing major. 
luckily. Exactly, yeah, because I know that there are some actors that had nothing nice to say about working with with Curtiz. Um, but I, I mean, I think everything about this movie is just so distinctive and and wonderful, really. You, we haven't touched on Ernest Holler's cinematography, which is just so expressive. And if, you know, Eddie Muller was here, he'd probably be going Splendid. on about some of the, the setups and, and all of that. And Ernest Holler, I mean, you could get probably some of the best films in cinema if you just watch the films that he was cinematographer on, which is some of the greats. Um, and he also did Baby Jane in, in 62. And that also has some beautiful cinematography. But I think that that's what also sticks out is seeing Joan's face, which is already so expressive. It's practically cut from marble in, in that, you know, fur hat with the, the jacket standing by the water in the beginning. Um, it's just, it's a perfect movie. I don't know anybody that doesn't like this. I think it's impossible to dislike Mildred Pierce. I, I think when, <laughs> I think when Crawford and Curtis routine for Flamingo Road, I, and Zachary Scott as well, although Eve Arden wasn't there, I think it proved that the script, you know, you still have to have a good script. Flamingo Road is ver very entertaining, but no, it doesn't compare to Mildred Pierce. The screenplay is just far inferior. So it's, it's always deep down, the actor, the director, the cinematography, those are all important, but you have to start with a solid script to begin with. Oh yeah. Samantha, is there anything else we want to touch on before we start wrapping it up? Uh, not that I can think of. I, I just would say again, Curtiz's brilliance in this film just really stands out. Um, I, I do think again, the cinematography is fantastic, but, but yeah, I feel like Curtiz is synonymous for me with classic, just like all of the best films of old Hollywood, you could really tie critiques to more or less. I mean, of course, there are so many others, but um, but him specifically as a director for Warner Brothers, he was that era, and he symbolized so many of the best pictures really ever made, and this is absolutely one of them. You can definitely see the depth. You can see the emotional complexity with the characters. The casting of this is just perfect. Um, but yeah, I feel like a lot of it should be attributed to Curtiz as well as Crawford. I agree. Yes. Yes. He did a splendid job. Absolutely. Bill, before we close things out, I wanted to get your opinion. If somebody wants to dive into the world of Joan Crawford, what are the movies you recommend, whether that's the, the big films or the deep cuts? What, what are the ones that you loved writing about in, in Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography, and what are the ones that you hope others will seek out? Well, after Mildred Pierce, I would recommend Sudden Fear. She was nominated for an Oscar. I would recommend Rain. She disavowed her performance in that, but I always thought she was terrific in that. But she was afraid uh, her fans would turn against her because she played a prostitute. But I thought she was very good in that. Autumn Leaves, that one she did with Robert Aldrich right before Baby Jane, which I also recommend. And she gave, gives a really lovely performance in that with her customary strength, but also her vulnerability is on display in that, uh, particularly when she uh, she goes to meet Cliff Robertson, who's had to go into a mental institution, and she's been told when he gets out, he may not love her anymore or even know her. And the look on her face as, she, as he approaches her is very powerful. Very good performance, a nice picture. And uh, the silent era, the unknown with Lon Chaney Jr., she gives a good performance in that. A woman's face, how can I almost forgot that one? A woman's face. That's controversial. Some people don't like it and they don't like her. She worked with George Cukor. I think he helped her get, guide her to a very good performance. And I think it's a very good movie. Uh, and those are the ones I would, Torch so well, Torch Song, it's interesting. Female on the Beach, it's fun. That's a fun movie, not a great movie. Uh, Straight Jacket, again, another fun movie, which shows her authority, the strength that's in her. You know, there's no one could, slap home the lines and get across with, with her certain dynamic intensity. That's the word. And she had intensity that you saw in very few other actresses, even more than Davis. 
Well, she was only nominated for an Oscar three times in, in her career. She won, obviously, for this, but she was also nominated in 48 for Possessed and 53 for Sudden Fear. Is that an accurate number for you, Bill? Should she have should she have been nominated more and for what? Uh, let's see. I think Rain, probably. I thought she was outstanding in that. Uh, Autumn Leaves, except there wasn't really a big enough picture, you know, for her to get an Oscar nomination. Uh, sir, sir, I can't say Straight Jacket, although she was good. That would never, let's face it, that type of movie doesn't get uh, Oscar nominations. But uh, uh, I should mention Possessed. Possessed, it's not a great movie. But she gives a good and interesting performance. There's in two it. versions of Which Possessed, possessed? Right? Yeah, I was going to uh, say there's a 40, 40s and a 30s, right? Yes, the 30s was with her great, the great love of her life, Clark Gable. But uh, I think the, the second one is a better picture. And Humoresque with John Garfield, that I would recommend. I shouldn't have left that one out. Kristen, Good the biggest John Garfield fan. My deceased oh. love, John Garfield, yes. <laughs> Well, then you probably, I'm sure you've enjoyed their picture because uh, they're a good team in that one. You wouldn't it, think they would work together, but they do. Right? They're both very tough characters, tough actors, and you would assume that that would be a detriment, but I see that movie as this weird, like, sadomasochistic like i think there'd be a lot of like angry makeouts between the two of them and there are they I mean that happens in the in the movie um but it's no it's great it's it's a different it's a different performance i think for her it's a different performance for him so future idea humoresque uh on the podcast sam is happening <laughs> well right, yeah uh well Bill, we had such fun talking to you about about this the movie and the book where so can did fans I. Where can fans find your you on the internet? Where can they find out more about your work? I, we know the book is now, I think it was be, it's republished now in paperback. Anything you want to throw out? Well, it's available on Amazon and in bookstores and Barnes and Noble. Uh, I have a blog called Great Old Movies, greatoldmovies.blogspot.com, where I write about classic films and not so classic films. I've done that for about 15, 16 years now. And another one that I've done a couple of years called B-Movie Nightmare, which is obviously about, you know, B-movies, exploitation films, serials, and things like that. I'm glad to hear, I'm glad to meet both of you, see that you love classic films, that you're carrying the torch for all these great movies. And I just think that's wonderful. It's terrific. Well, you can find me on Twitter at journeys underscore film. And remember the podcast has its own website, which is journeysandclassicfilm.com, where you can find reviews of other stuff. We do our TCM picks. We have all sorts of things as well as the show notes up there. So you can head on over to that. Samantha, where can fans find you online? What's going on with your work? Well, you can find my blog posts at musingsofaclassicfilmatic.com. Every month you should hopefully soon be seeing my Cooking with the Stars posts at ClassicMovieHub.com. And I'm most frequent on Twitter at ClassicFilmGeek. And you can always find Drea Clark, our other co-host, at the Drea Clark uh, on Twitter. And we have our Instagram at TicklishBiz. We're all over the internet. You can, of course, get the uh, podcast wherever you get your podcast, whether that's Apple Podcasts, if you're on there, help us out with a review. We're also on Spotify, Player FM, iHeartRadio, Audible. I did not realize we were on Audible, but we are. So you can find us anywhere. Uh, if you want to support us with your dollars and get all sorts of free uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, pins, all sorts of fun stuff. We're on Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. We also do a bunch of bonus shows on there. If you can't get enough of this, we do based on a true podcast where we look at biopics. We just did our most recent episode on introducing Dorothy Dandridge, which is also on HBO Max. I promise we're not getting money from HBO Max. Um, and we also have double features, which we are working on our next episode on three dueling versions of the Three Musketeers. So you can find out more over over at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. But we will be back next time with a whole new classic film to discuss. Till then.